I wish I knew how hard hard is because when I thought that I was training hard, I really wasn't doing anything at all. Hi guys, I'm Anna Glavinsky and this is a Ride to Unite podcast for We Love Cycling. In today's episode, we invite Juliet Elliott onto the screen, who is a hugely popular figurehead in cycling. If you're not following her already, you must be living under a rock. She tells us about her beginnings as a social media influencer, lets us know what is her worst tattoo, and has a massive rant about the divide in cycling tribes. It's a must listen. Let's welcome Juliet. All right, so Juliet, you are a wearer of many hats and helmets, actually. Uh, it's hard to give you a title, whether it's pro racer or influencer, content creator. It, it could be any number of things, but you do race pretty much every discipline of bikes. You have sponsors and you're immensely popular online. So I think in this interview, we really want to pick your brains, get some knowledge and some tips from that immense experience that you've had within cycling and also get to know the person a little bit more behind the screen and I think that some people could watch this and think well we see so much content from you you know you're churning it out on a weekly basis sometimes on a daily basis and you have been for years is there anything more to know but I know that you have got a lot of variety up that tattooed sleeve of yours so um, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it finding out some, a little bit more, a little bit um, of some unusual things about you as well. But we're going to start with some of the, the stuff that people might already know, but we'll find out. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Cool. So your background, how have you got to where you are and where are you? Like, how would you describe your job title? <laughs> well, my job title, it does seem to change depending on I suppose it depends on what I'm doing that is most successful at any given time. Currently, I suppose, it also depends who I'm talking to because uh, depending on which generation I'm trying to explain my job to, you know, there are certain things that make sense to them. Right now, if someone asks me, a complete stranger, and they're not involved in cycling, they ask me what I do. I say I'm a, I'm a YouTuber. I say I make, make YouTube videos about cycling. And most people seem to get that. But um, stepping back from the YouTube, I mean, I have sponsors that support my racing and that have come on board before the YouTube thing even happened. So really, I would say I'm a cyclist with a big following. I don't mean to start moaning straight away, but I find it really annoying when people just call you an influencer because it sounds like your raison d'etre is to influence. And it isn't. If I influence people, well, that's sort of a byproduct of me just doing my bike racing and putting out my videos. It's not like my raison d'etre. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's why I did the little influences because I think a lot of people that do get the limelight, get tar well, tarnished, it's not really a fair word to use, but get that title put on them and people don't always sit very comfortably with it. Yeah. And so is it, I mean, is it all just one big cycling holiday where you just swan around on your bike influencing people? <laughs> Well, you know what? It's not bad, Anna. I do have a really good time. I get to do some really cool things and um, most of it is driven by myself. So that's really cool. You know, um, certain sponsors I work with say, we want you to go and make some videos using our tires, for instance. Um, where do you want to go? We'll support you. You go and do it, take the photos, make the content. That's all we need from you. So that's kind of a dream job, right? I love cycling. I get to choose where I do it and people support me to do it. Um, but, oh gosh, what was the question, Anna? <laughs> I don't even remember myself now. Is it just a cycling holiday? Like, is That's it just it. a breeze where you just swan around on your bike? Yeah, well, um, I mean, in some ways, yes, because I do get to do a lot of nice things and um, I get to choose a lot of the things I do myself. But in other ways, no, because it's really hard work. You know, it's, it, you, you work in all hours of the day and night, particularly as I have a child, you know, that makes things more difficult and a husband who rides races and also makes YouTube videos. Um, you know, I work really hard. You don't just kind of, you know, just quickly put out a YouTube video and that's it. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of effort. There's all the editing and then there's all the promotion on all the different platforms, you know, doing your thumbnail, writing your description, doing your tags. You know, it's not just one quick thing that you do. It's a lot of work. 
and you have to um, make sure that you fulfill all your obligations to the people that support you. So, you know, I have to make sure that I give shout outs to people that help me do this and behave in a way that reflects well on them. So it's not quite as just happy go lucky as it might first appear. You know, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. But yes, it's awesome. And I do get to have a lot of fun riding my bike. Yeah, I'm well aware of how hard you do actually work behind the scenes. I think sometimes it might not look like that on the front, but you do work hard and it's obviously worth it. You're enjoying it. And to many people, it is a dream job. So, I mean, how did you get to where you are? Um, well, I'd say I got here by a combination of hard work, you know, good luck and also, well, privilege, you know, because I had a great upbringing, a comfortable upbringing and uh, my parents gave me the confidence to go out and pursue my dreams and I've always had a safety net as well not a lot of people have such privilege so I'm fully aware of that but um, it's been hard work and I've done this gradually over a number of years I didn't just sort of pop up on Instagram start trying to take pretty photos and you know it's a done deal I started writing my blog in 2007 and, um, you know, I worked really hard on that blog, shooting all my own photos, writing loads of stuff. From that, I started writing for other publications and shooting photos for them as well. Um, I then jumped on Facebook when that was happening and set up an Instagram when that was growing. And then I thought YouTube could be really cool because um, it was just another sort of way of telling the stories that I was telling over on my blog. So it all just kind of happened because um, I'd spot something that I thought looked fun to do that would um, that people would be interested in engaging with, and um, I would work hard to grow those channels. And sort of, how many years later is it? Thirteen years later, I'm doing it full time. So yeah, it's a lot of hard work some luck meeting the right people and you know also having the confidence and the background that enables me to do these things because your background is pretty interesting like you've always been doing your own thing it's not like you just like you said you just suddenly woke up one day and could do it maybe your background helped you become the person that was able to pursue those dreams so do you want to tell us a little bit about what you were doing before it was cycling because it hasn't always been cycling for you Sure. Well, I've pretty much always been self-employed and it's always been, the stuff that I've done has always been driven by um, how much effort I put in. You know, what you put in, you get out. And so I think that's always been a constant in my life. I started off doing some modelling and although I actually wasn't crazy about modelling, I gave it my all and I made sure that I was the best person to work with on the day that you know people liked me and remembered me that I worked really hard and didn't take it for granted and I was pretty successful then with snowboarding um, I learned about um, working with sponsors how you have to deliver what you said you'll deliver how you need to be accountable and show them all the coverage they've got and um, all that sort of thing I then moved from snowboarding into um, playing music and um, I was in a couple of bands, I worked as a session player and I worked at a mu uh, record label. Um, so I don't know what that taught me, apart from how to drink a lot of beer. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your instrument? Guitar. Ah, uh, okay. Do you still play? Yeah. Uh, yes, I just bought, I bought a new guitar in lockdown because I stopped playing for so long, and um, I just I mean I have a guitar, but I decided I wanted a shiny new, different one. And it was my present to myself to kind of get me back into playing. And it's worked. I've started playing again. Oh, so, yeah, all those things that I've done in the past. At the end of this interview, can we get you to give us a couple of riffs? Oh, God, maybe. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Little wings lead there. So, um, doing, doing the beer drinking and the guitar playing, that led you to... Um, well, after playing in a band I then settled in London and I was working at the record label and um, that's how I got into cycling because I needed a way of getting to and from work so I started cycling um, to commute um, so I suppose by some there's some weird path that led me to cycling and they, they've all all those different jobs I've done 
have enabled me to now do what I do, I suppose. I suppose I picked up techniques or learnt lessons along the way and they all sort of have helped me, yeah, helped me make this a success. And some of it, I guess, was being in the right place at the right time, because you said you were in London and you were picking up a bike and the fixie scene at that time was exploding. And you also got some work as a courier. So did those sorts of things merge together and give you an opportunity that literally yeah. just because you were there at that moment that it sort of happened for you? Well, it's not a hundred percent just I happened to be in the right place at the right time because um, there was more to it than that. But absolutely, it is you know the the zeitgeist and knowing the right people. What actually happened was um, I I get really obsessed with things and I got really obsessed with riding fixed gear bikes and learning to do tricks on them. And I spent, a, I mean, hours and hours and hours learning wheelies and body hops and um, 180s. And I mean, just, I just was relentless in trying to learn all this stuff. Um, and then Charge Bikes came along and they were already sponsoring a fixed gear rider called Super Ted. And um, they were friends, Nick from Charge was friends with the guys at Fixed Gear London. And they knew me, not very well, but they knew me and they knew that I was doing all these tricks and no other girls were. I mean, at all. No yeah. one else was doing it that was, a, that was a woman. And so they said, um, Nick from Charge asked them about which women were, they, they should sponsor and they suggested me. So absolutely, it was luck that I knew Super Ted and Andy from Fitzgear London, but it wasn't luck that I got sponsored. It wasn't just because I was a woman, it's because I was doing all this stuff that no one else was doing. Yeah. Well, you've got to get out there and be doing it. You know, even if it is, you know, there's some coincidences that played in, played its part. But you've yeah. got to be there turning up and showing up. It's not just, well, it's not just a pretend image that you're putting out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but then the fixie scene did explode and you sort of exploded with it. Um, and you also evolved as a rider as that scene developed what what sort of changes have happened over the last few years with it and with you well well fix the fixed gear scenes basically died a death since which is so sad because it was so much fun but it evolved it evolved from people doing tricks and do, skidding about in car parks uh, that kind of people lost interest in that and um gained a great deal more interest in fixed gear racing and um, Red Hook Crit came to London, that sort of helped the momentum continue. And so yeah, Fixed Gear kind of changed into racing and everyone got really into that, myself included. Um, but then Red Hook finished and all the Fixed Gear riders have just kind of disappeared off doing their own thing now. So the big sense of community, well, I think it's still there in our heads and we all still feel connected, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> There's nothing going on for us to go and do together. We used to all go to Red Hook Crit in Barcelona and have the absolute best time. You spend the week swimming and um, going to the beach and drinking a few beers and then you'd have the race and the party. And it was, it was just, it was such a wonderful time and we all had so much fun. But um, yeah, that's not happening anymore. I think most of the fixed gear riders are doing, um, well, mo most of the ones that still race are doing gravel racing nowadays, I think. Mm, yeah, because that was going to be my next question. Where's everyone gone and what are they doing? Because I don't think people have lost a love of cycling. I think the no. word evolution is the key word here. You know, people have evolved and things have changed. So you're saying lots of them have gone to gravel and you yourself do a little bit of gravel and all sorts of cycling. So how did you discover the other sports? Do you like them? <laughs> Which yeah. ones do you like? Why? How? Well, um, I got into all the other kinds of cycling when um, Dave, my husband and I, Dave, we moved to Devon and uh, we only had fixed gear bikes when we moved here and we went out for a ride and oh my God, it's so hilly. It's just, it's so hilly here. It's a massive challenge. So to do that on one gear was just almost impossible. Um, so we started trying out different bikes. I joined the local cycling club, started going out on a few club runs. Um, I think I tried one of those go ride cyclocross races. I hated it, but anyway, 
that didn't go off. love cyclocross. It's so hard. Oh my god, it's like the hardest thing ever. Yeah, it's but, like um, going really hard and really slow for an hour. Oh my god, yeah. I mean, I, I personally, well, I did the first race. I hated it. A couple of years later, I was like, no, I'm going to try again. I tried another one, and I was like, mm, yeah, still not loving this. But anyway, um, I tried some different types of cycling, and then. Um, I was lucky because I was sponsored by Charge and they make a load of different kinds of bikes. So um, they would send over a mountain bike for me to borrow and I tried that out, I got into mountain biking. So um, just by trying lots of different disciplines, I figured out which ones I like best. And um, yeah, I like, I, well I like all of it apart from cyclocross. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that you've got a favourite? Um, you know what, my favourite, probably the same as you, it's doing jumps. It's jumps. Yeah. Oh my God, I love it. Riding trails. It's just the best thing ever. And weirdly, it's the thing that I do the least because you know this. It's so hard to find the right spot to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Like if, you're, if you're amazing, then you can turn up anywhere and hit these enormous jumps. If you're trying to progress, it's really difficult to find the right place to do that. So... There's a place I love in Cornwall called The Track, and it's only a couple of hours away, but it's still, you know, I've got a family and I've got other things to do and other obligations. We don't get down there very much. And when I do, I'm like, oh my God, I love this. I love this, I love this. It's the best thing. So probably that's my favorite, riding jumps. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And what you're saying there about finding places for regret, progression, it's my biggest bugbear in life. Like, where do you find places that you can get better as a rider you have to be really good already like it just has to happen yeah. magically it's so annoying and what about like sponsor wise do you get sort of pigeonholed into having to do what you're asked to do when actually you'd rather be maybe on a different type of bike because you're saying that you get to lead a lot of it so how much yeah. comes from externally and how much do you get to choose what you want to do um i i pretty much entirely get to do what i want to do um, which is really nice, as long as what I'm doing is, um, well, no one's ever said this, but I would assume that as long as what I'm doing is relevant or credible or interesting to other people, then my sponsors are happy because the whole point of it is that I'm getting their brand out there, I'm showing it in a good light, I'm showing cycling as a fun thing that people will want to get involved in. And um, as long as I'm doing that, my sponsors seem pretty happy. I guess I'm lucky to be, I'm lucky to have the ones that I've got. They're, um, yeah, they let me lead the whole thing. So what I would normally do is at the beginning of the year, I would set out my goals. And um, this year was gonna be full on gravel racing. I was training so hard all winter, so, so hard. And I was gonna just, yeah, I was gonna really focus on getting some really good results at gravel races, that's what I wanted. Um, you know, um, but obviously everything changed with COVID um, and I've ended up doing totally different stuff, mainly bike packing and um, gravel rides locally and I'm lucky it's lovely where I live. Um, but uh, that, that goes down well with the sponsors and followers and stuff because um, it's still me having fun on a bike somewhere cool so I guess, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky that I can do that. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, it's all led by me and I'm lucky to have the support of the sponsors I do. Yeah, and 2020 has been a weird year for everyone, to be honest. Like there's, there's no getting around how many changes everybody's had to make. So I want to pick up on that very, very shortly. But you mentioned something else there, which I want to delve into, which is training. Because originally you were never one for training. It was... <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? When did you become somebody that measures your power outputs and drinks your protein shakes and all that sort of thing? <laughs> well, you know what? It was it was Red Hook Crit. I um I decided I wanted to enter Red Hook Crit, the fixed gear race series, and um I entered it on a whim about a month before the first event and I'd never done any training and I decided I didn't want to do training. It was going to make cycling not fun, blah, blah, blah. But with a month before Red Hook Crit, a coach called James um, got in touch after we saw, well, I announced on social media that I was going to race it because I wanted to make myself not back out. 
So I was like, if this is in the public realm, I'll have to do it. So anyway, this coach, James, saw it and he contacted me and said, do you want me to give you a training plan for a month? Um, and he did. And I just, I actually found the whole process quite interesting in the end. And, and I really, really saw the results. You know, there's no way I would have got around that first race at Red Hook Quit London without um, getting lapped or pulled out if I hadn't trained that hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm, I, as I said earlier, I'm quite an obsessive person. And if I get into something, I really, really get into something. So I found that happened with the training. I just got quite obsessive about it. And um, I enjoy the process. It makes me feel good. I like the results. And I like having the focus these days. So even now, I'm not racing at all this year. Actually, there is a race at the end of the month. Apart from the race at the end of the month, um, I'm not really racing, but I'm still doing structured training because I found that I enjoy it. What a, what a turnaround. Who would have thought? <laughs> Your younger self would just be like, what are you doing? Well, I know, but my younger self would, yeah, wouldn't even recognise me now. <laughs> But as we keep coming back to you, you're obviously loving it and, and that's what counts. And doing the training helps you get those results in those races. How do you feel about racing? How, how competitive are you? Um, well, I am and, quite oh, sorry, and one, sorry, before you start, so like we this in as well. And what about your sponsors in terms of getting results? So yeah. how do you feel like being competitive yourself and delivering actual results for your sponsors in a race? Well, see, it depends on, in terms of the sponsorship, it depends on what the race is, because um, if I decide that I'm going to turn up to do a mountain bike race, because I think it'd be fun, my sponsors aren't going to expect me to win it, because I'm not sponsored for being a mountain biker, you know, so that takes the pressure off a little bit. I am competitive, and I do want to do well. I always play it down, because... I figure I'd rather be um, pleased with a good result rather than be disappointed with a bad one. So I always kind of think, oh, I'm just here for the fun. I just want to get through the race. I don't mind how I do, but secretly, I really do mind. Um, so, yeah, it's been weird this year. I, I was saying to Dave yesterday that I just felt really kind of like flat because you get so much adrenaline and excitement and everything from racing and that's been missing this year. So although I have been having a nice time doing local stuff, I really miss the thrill of racing. It's so hard, but it's so exciting and rewarding. And yeah, I mean, I do love it. So next year I'll be looking to get back into doing some races if, if there are any. Yeah, who knows, who knows, watch this space. I guess it's yeah. that addiction that brings you back as well, isn't it? That adrenaline creates addiction and you just want more and more of it. And you've mentioned about your family life as well, because you've got a fairly new, not that new anymore, actually, but a fairly new addition to your family. You've adopted a yeah. daughter. How yeah. has that changed your life in terms of training and your career and juggling all of that? Well, it's made everything much more complicated and difficult, <laughs> of course. But, oh gosh, it's the best thing I've ever done, ever. I mean, I can't even, I can't even begin to describe how wonderful it is to have her. I just, it's, I'm madly in love with her and it makes everything wonderful. So uh, in terms of the training and all that, I mean, it's, it has changed everything. I do a lot more indoor training on my Watt bike. Um, I barely ever ride with Dave anymore because obviously one of us is nor normally looking after her. So... Yeah, I do a lot of riding on my own, and um, so I suppose that's made it less interesting. But you know, it's balanced by all the wonderful things you get from being a mother, so I can't complain, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she loves two wheels as well, doesn't she? Was oh, that luck, okay. or did she, did she have any choice in the matter? <laughs> well, um, I, I always say to Dave, oh, I can't believe it, what incredible luck that, you know, our daughter loves cycling. And he's like, come on, that's because of us. We've done that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, we haven't. We didn't force her to ride or do anything. And he's like, no, we didn't force her to do anything. But she's subtly influenced by everything she sees. Like she watches, my, if I'm away on a trip, Dave will put on my YouTube videos so she can see where I am and what I'm doing. And so she'll, and she'll come to watch bike races with us. There are bikes all over the house. Like she learns how to work on her own bike and wash it after she's been riding and stuff. So she's just totally and utterly surrounded by it. Um, 
But she does genuinely love it and she wants to do it all the time, which of course I encourage. So, you know, I'll take her down to the BMX track on a Sunday morning to ride about and we, um, we take her out down the cycle path and stuff like that. So yeah, I feel like it's the luckiest thing ever, but Dave's like, yeah, come on. That's <laughs> <up."> <laughs> well, I mean, I have heard of parents who are mad keen on cycling and their kids haven't got into it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It does happen. Dave's had messages from people on Instagram saying, how did you get your daughter into cycling? We, we tried so hard and ours isn't interested. But I think the difference is that we're both cyclists. You know, in some families, it's just one parent. Um, whereas with us, it's both of us. So, I mean, it's, it's all she knows, I suppose. Yeah. And you're clearly loving it as well. So I guess that infection that you put out online, which is what makes you so popular, you know, the fact that you love it, is what gets everyone else hooked on it. And that's probably what's yeah. been passed on to her as well. That yeah. she's enjoying And that maybe the fact that you do all different disciplines, because then she gets to try out different ones. And I mean, for me, that's one of the biggest joys of cycling. No matter what your personality type is, you're going to find something within cycling that suits exactly. you. Yeah. So maybe she's just found, you know, what, what takes off for her. Yeah, we were out you riding the, the different ones. Yeah, exactly. We take her out to the local mountain bike trails and she potters around on the blue. And I took her out the other day um, up near Exeter and there's a, a sort of gravel path on the way back and she was going along. She's like, Look, mommy, I'm a gravel cyclist. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. Oh, she knows all the different types. So yeah. 2020, uh, let's talk about this year because it's just been bonkers and it's going to have had some huge impacts on you. And like you said, you were planning to be racing super hard and all of that's gone out the window. So how have you coped with it? What, what changes have you had to make? Well... <sighs> It's been, it's been tough. I mean, essentially, you just have to let it go. Just stop sort of resisting um, what's happened and trying to continue doing what you thought you'd be doing. You just have to let it all go and just sort of make it up as you go along, I suppose. So, you know, there was a time back at the beginning of March when lockdown started, when we all thought this was going to be short lived. So at that point in time, you know, we were all training really hard. We'd all do PE with Joe every morning and Dave and I would be on our walk bike the whole time, you know, just hoping to um, stay fit for this short period of time and then get straight back onto the racing. But obviously it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen. Races got postponed and um, even then I wasn't sure they'd ever really happen. And as it turns out, they aren't happening. So I think... 2020 has just been about letting your expectations go and just sort of deciding what to do, you know, each day, just one day at a time. It's so yeah. weird, isn't it? Like, at first I felt really unsettled by it, but I suppose like anything, you get used to it, don't you? Now it's just like, well, this is what it's like. Yeah, I do know what you mean about sort of getting used to it, getting used to uncertainty in a way is yeah. one of the main things. And you just touched on there, like feeling unsettled, like what have your biggest anxieties and fears been during this time? Because I think it's impossible for a global pandemic to hit and people not to be affected by it. So what's worried you the most? Well, the, the thing that worried me the most really was, I, I felt so awful for our daughter because she's three and she's stuck in a house with two grown ups the entire time. And we, you know, Dave and I are, can be very silly. So we'll totally get down on her level and have tea parties with her and stuff. Um, so we did, obviously we do play with her, um, you know, in that sort of way that suits her age. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're old people to her. And I felt just so, so sorry for her not having any little children to play with. And, you know, just little things like when you're at home with your parents, you get corrected all the time. You get told what to do and not to do. And when you're with your little mates at preschool or whatever, I mean, obviously they don't let them run wild, but you do get left to just play and do what you want sometimes. So I felt like, sorry for her being kind of controlled the entire time, stuck with grown-ups and not getting to let loose and play with kids. And then every time we'd, um, you know, you'd see the playgrounds and they're all taped off with that police tape. And I just thought, oh, it's just so awful for them. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I suppose, yeah, that's been the main thing. 
cycling, you know, is secondary. I care more about her than any of that. Yeah. And so how have you managed to cope? How have you kept on top of that? You know, the worries for her and keeping yourselves busy, keeping yourselves happy and not getting stuck in a rut. Well, you know, we ended up spending a lot more time together as a family doing nice things outdoors, you know, and getting away even further from consumerism, which has been really cool. You know, um, we realised how much money we were spending on coffee in, we'd be in coffee shops the entire time. So um, we've rained back on all that sort of thing and we do lot, a lot more stuff outside. So that's been great. Um, but for her, everything started going a little bit more back to normal. You know, the playgrounds are open. Um, She's still, swimming pools still aren't open. So we've started swimming in the sea all the time, which is cool. So um, yeah, it's getting much better here. I just obviously dreading a second wave like everyone, particularly yeah. in the winter. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, gosh, when winter hits, because you've been doing a lot more indoor riding. Again, you mentioned that earlier um, and some lead rides. So tell us a little bit about that. Did they just start because of lockdown or was this something that you already had planned? Well, um, I've always ridden on Zwift. I, I really enjoy, enjoy indoor training because it's so effective and, uh, and such a good use of your time. You know, if I've only got an hour to ride, if I try and ride outside, by the time I've got all my stuff together and got out the door, I've wasted half my time. Um, so um, uh, working with the Skoda DSI Cycling Academy women and internationals, there's been some rides on Zwift. They started off... Um, fairly near the start of lockdown. It's just a way for everyone to get together, ride, you can chat through the app and everything. So those were happening um, at 7 a.m. initially, which wasn't great for my neighbours, but anyway. <laughs> um, the rides are continuing. I think the times have changed, so I'll have to check when they are. Um, but yeah, it's a social ride. You can still chat to the other riders, whether you manage to keep up with them or not, because obviously it's a virtual ride. But the conversation is, sort of banded together so you you can still get that interaction and it's a nice way of um you know chatting with other women riders it's not a women's only ride but you know you've obviously got the dsi cycling academy women and international so there's lots of women you get to chat you get to stretch your legs i'd really recommend them i really enjoy them particularly as i do ride on my own a lot so when i get on those um virtual rides i'm just like la, 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 la. <laughs> chatting away you can't stop me do you think it's given you that social fix because the cycling community is such a huge part of your life and the reason why you do it it's not just about getting the miles in it's about connecting with other people do you get that from those rides online yeah i absolutely i do get that from those rides and that's why i like them um you know i could just sit on my turbo trainer and grind out the miles um and that would be effective in terms of training but it's far more fun to be chatting away to other people so yeah, I am, I am normally one of the chatty ones who doesn't shut up. Sometimes people are like, how are you even typing that? We're meant to be doing an effort. But yeah, I like all that. And that's why I like, you know, my job with the YouTube and all that sort of thing, because you get so much feedback from people and you can chat to them in the comments. You know, I live in, um, in Devon and um, I, I'm going to make myself sound really sad, but I don't go out much apart from cycling. So when all of a sudden I couldn't go out and ride and I couldn't go on the club run and I couldn't meet other people for a ride, it, it, it was quite isolating. Mm. So um, those social rides are really beneficial, um, as is, you know, just chatting to people in the YouTube comments and stuff. What we're going to do now, you're known for being quite outspoken. You know, you're not somebody that holds back on what you think about and what you believe in. And with your thorough experience in cycling, you've had in-depth experience across a whole load of things from pro racing to beginner cycling and all the different disciplines. I would like to sort of do a Juliet think tank, like a Juliet opinion piece type thing. So it's just yeah. your opportunity to talk about what you want from the heart. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of topics. So first up, I'd like to know your opinion on catch-all women's cycling so where are we at where do you think it's going to go what do you think needs to be done to reduce that gender gap and what areas should we be thinking about and talking about over to you oh gosh this is a big topic and you're giving me nowhere to start thank you anna <laughs> but i am good at talking so I, I i'll try my best um well women's cycling where we're at i feel like we are 
in a much better place than we were before. Women's cycling is growing, participation is growing. You know, we've got um, new structure in women's pro cycling. You know, nowadays um, you have to pay, you, uh, nowadays you have to have um, a certain threshold for women's cycling teams to be on the um, women's pro tour which is good in some ways, bad in others, because obviously it meant some teams didn't make it into the world tour. Um, but the main thing is I feel like we need more visibility. So more, 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 more. I, I'm never satisfied. What helps uh, progress women's sport in every single way, you know, in terms of sponsorship, in terms of um, salaries, in terms of everything, is visibility. So... Um, we mentioned earlier that I uh, raced in Red Hook Crit, uh, the fixed gear crit uh, race series. The reason I entered those races was because I went along and I saw other women racing. I just so happened to be at the first ever um, Red Hook Crit women's race in Milan. And I saw the other women racing and I thought, whoa, look at these women. I, I want to be there with them. I want to be on that side of the barriers with them, not on this side watching. And it's because I saw them doing it that I thought maybe I could have a go. If I'd have turned up to that race and it would have just been a men's race, which it was the year before, at no point would I have thought that was a possibility for me. So I think the main issue with women's cycling and with uptake and with everything is the fact that we don't see enough female cyclists you know, in the media. They aren't celebrated enough. Their stories aren't told enough. So girls growing up, don't necessarily think or know that um, cycling is for them. Obviously, if you grew up in a family like mine, you're going to know, yes, you can be a pro cyclist. Yes, you can do this. Here's how you get into racing. Here's how you do that. But if you come from a non-cycling background, it's completely impenetrable and doubly so for women. So I think the main thing we need is, um, you know, more examples of women cyclists of every kind out there in the media, from the pro level right down to, you know, people commuting. I knew you could do this, Julia. <laughs> cool. So what I want to ask you about next is how you feel as a responsibility, as we're going back to that word, as an influencer, because like it or not, you're watched by tens of thousands of people on a weekly basis. And you have to represent brands. Maybe sometimes you might feel like you have to sell out. Do you ever have to feel like you have to say something that's not what you want to say? How much of a responsibility do you feel about giving across a positive message to other women cyclists and cyclists in general? And also how much pressure do you feel? Do you ever feel that you have to be perfect and get it right, get good race results, be a perfect mum, be pretty, be skinny, be strong, be eating the right stuff? So responsibility and pressure in an online sphere take it away <laughs> right well um when it comes to the responsibility thing um i do like to do the most basic sort of things such as wear a helmet the whole time because i would like to encourage other people to wear them i don't think that it should be um the law but i i think people should wear helmets um, so I, I, I see it as my responsibility to wear one if I think that that's the right thing for other people to do. Um, i say it again, I don't think it should be the law, it's a personal choice, but yeah, if I want people to wear them, I'm going to wear one. Um, in terms of other responsibilities online, well, I, um, I try not to swear. You, we've known each other for a few years, you know that actually I swear quite a lot, but I try not to swear in my videos and stuff because I get messages from people saying that they watch my videos with their children and that I'm a huge inspiration to them. And um, I get really nice messages of people saying that they showed it to their daughters and that they really look up to me and things like that. So I think that um, definitely being a positive influence and not swearing um, is, is the way to go. Um, other than that, I wouldn't say that there's a great deal that I think about. I do just go out and do what I'm going to do anyway and film it. And um, I'm lucky in that I find cycling so thrilling and exciting and joy, joy making that all I've got to do is go and do it. And that comes across. Um, you mentioned the pressure that you get from being a sort of public figure. Normally, 
that sort of thing doesn't bother me and I just shrug off silly comments um, because I get them, you know, about my tattoos, um, about my teeth. I get told I should have braces because I've got wonky teeth. Normally I shrug all that stuff off and I don't really care. But at the end of the day, I'm still human. So if you get me on a bad day and I'm feeling down about something or something tough has happened, completely unrelated to cycling or whatever, you get me on a bad day and you say something like that, it's going to upset me. So, you know, I do try not to um, let things get to me, but sometimes they do. But yeah, because yeah. I saw some of your tweets recently about um, people saying horrible comments. And it's just, it's, I just don't know why people spend their time needing to do that. And I think, I know it can be really upsetting, but like, the proof is in the pudding. The numbers are there. The people want to watch you. And if people don't like it, they just don't have to watch it. Like just don't thing. watch it. It's, it's so weird. It's like, yeah. what are you doing here on my yeah. channel? This is my channel. You don't like <laughs> yeah. it. Go away. <laughs> and if you weren't doing well, you wouldn't have the numbers. Yeah, if people didn't want yeah. to see it, well, then you'd have to adapt and, and do something, wouldn't you? And, you know, yeah. I always, like, something I always go back to as well is, like, people like Cheryl Cole get told that they're ugly. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, well, you know, that's just not true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there was, oh, this one I wanted to say to you when I saw a tweet as well. I once did a how to track stand video and someone commented saying you can't track stand. And it, this was the best negative comment I've ever had in my life because it was almost like a light bulb went off. And I was like, but I'm track standing. That's so... What what's I'm happened doing. here is you're just talking crap yeah and then from that moment on I could like do that with any other negative comment I've ever seen I'm like well I don't they could just be talking crap because I know that people will say something that's not true it's not even based in reality yeah the other thing that I get quite a lot is mansplaining and oh, it, it, it drives my husband Dave mad as much as it drives me mad because you know he's He's a feminist, as every man should be. Um, so we could put out two identical videos um, of me, I don't know, changing a tire. And on my video, I'll get people saying, oh, you don't want to do it like that. You should be doing it like this. Or did you know that you have to da 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 Or all this stuff. And Dave's like, really? Why'd you get that? I put out a video recently about how to choose whether to use, well, the pros and cons of 650B wheels versus 700C wheels. And um, basically, you've got a small wheel with a big tyre, or you've got a big wheel with a small tyre. So I mentioned that um, if you had, this is really technically boring, but anyway, if you had a 650B wheel with a 45C tyre on, it's the same diameter as a 700C wheel with a 28C tyre on, yeah? Someone writes in the comments, you didn't say, that actually, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, have you even watched the video? I mean, I say those words verbatim, like, I say them, that's it. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I always think the, the more stupid the comment, the more confidence it gives me about other stupid comments, because you're like, oh, it's just yeah. stupid. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I just laugh about most of them. I do, I laugh about most of the stupid comments, but as I said, if you're having a, a rubbish day, then those things get to you, because, you know, you're vulnerable to them. It's, um, and yeah. it's just one of the hazards of putting yourself out there on in the public sphere so yeah. maybe maybe i just need to not look at the comments when i'm having a bad day because normally i look at them and i'm like ah, look at what this idiot said <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because it depends on what you mood you're in okay well that um going off tangent a little bit it's always great chatting to you um so final think tank topic the cycling community, let's talk about that. I'd love to hear what you think because you've ridden every different discipline of bikes. You've been part of the world as it's evolved. You've also had to adapt to social distancing and all that sort of thing. Are the tribes within cycling very different? Are they separated? And, or are there commonalities that bring everybody together? So anything about cycling and the community that you want to talk about? Well, this, I love the cycling community and um, it's because of that community that I really got into cycling. You know, when I first got into fixed gear, people were so welcoming and there was so much going on. You know, there were meetups on Brick Lane and 
and there were forums where people would help you with mechanical problems and it was all yeah it was the social aspect that I enjoyed almost as much as the actual cycling itself then I got more into other kinds of cycling road cycling I, I love lo uh, local cycling club culture I just love that that you can go for a ride with a 70 year old and they will give you tips or you know share a piece of cake with you and you're all you're all equal because you're all cycling and these are people that you wouldn't necessarily meet or hang out with were it not for cycling so i love that um in terms of tribes i find that whole tribe thing super annoying because there is division between different kinds of cyclists even with my friends i have good friends who are mountain bikers and they'll be like oh bloody roadies and all this stuff and i'm like it's, I just cannot understand it. You're just riding a bike. Why does it matter? I mean, honestly, it really gets me why people would have a problem with what tyre size you've got. But yeah, people still do. There's so much division within cycling. And considering we're so hated by some car drivers, you'd think we should have some unity rather than then turn on one another. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is just gonna be Juliet's rants. <laughs> um all right, let's sort of rattle through this. I'm conscious of time as well, and you probably have to go. Um loads to do. So um some really quick fire questions, if you can just answer these in one sentence. Yes. Okay. As a cyclist, what do you wish you knew when you were younger that you know now? Um, I wish I knew how hard hard is because when I thought that I was training hard, I really wasn't doing anything at all. So no wonder I wasn't very fast. <laughs> <laughs> What's your current FTP? Uh, 217 watts. How competitive are you? Uh, I'm very competitive, but I tend to I'm in denial. I, I pretend that I'm not, but I am. What suits you more, short and sharp or endurance? Oh, short and sharp, honestly, but I am trying to get more into endurance stuff. If you won the lottery, you never need to work again, but you're only allowed to ride one type of bike for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, this is the worst question. I hate this question, Anna. Uh, and I've won the lottery. Yeah, so you don't so need to go work. anywhere I want. Yeah. I'd probably ride my mountain bike and I'd go to all the best bike parks all the way around the world. <laughs> What's your worst tattoo? Oh, I have this terrible pair of scissors, really wonkily done by a mate when we'd been drinking as well. So, yeah, they <laughs> suck. Um, career wise, do you have a five year plan, exit strategy, or all of, any of those other business things that business people have? No, I make everything up as I go along. <laughs> um, through your career, what races, any discipline stand out as a highlight? Um, Red Hook Crit is a huge highlight, particularly, um, well, obviously the ones where I did well, but one that I'll never forget is Red Hook Crit London, where it was lashing it down with torrential rain. And I just found it really fun. It sounds cheesy, but I felt like a warrior, you know, like just doing this amazing race that was so hard and there I was powering through and I felt fit and fast and strong. It felt amazing. <laughs> Epic battle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What Zwift rides have you got coming up that you're leading that other people can join? Um, there is the Skoda DSi Academy Zwift ride with internationals. I'll be part of that. So please do come along and chat to me because I don't want to be Billy No Mates just chatting into, into the internet on my own. Just please come and chat and ride, it's so fun. Excellent, all right, we're coming to the end now, don't worry, it's the last little bit. Life hacks, you've suffered from debilitating, you've suffered from debilitating lower back pain as a cyclist. Anybody else suffering from the same thing, what top tips have worked for you to maintain good back, lower back health? Um, the best, absolute best thing for me is going to the gym and doing strength work. It's just, it's absolutely vital. So my tip would be that to make sure that you um, go and see a personal trainer. Um, if you have any um, 
real, real big concerns about your back, you need to go and see a doctor. But um, in terms of working on um, strengthening your back so you don't get so much pain when you're cycling, it's got to be the gym. I, um, I went for a ride on my road bike yesterday and um, because I've not been to the gym, because of lockdown, I can, I, I can tell my back feels achy and um, weak. So yeah, get down to the gym and get a good program of strength training. Fantastic. Okay, and final life hack. What are your top parenting tips for cycling with children? Oh, um, just make it fun. Just always make it fun. Um, never make them ride more than they want to. Always have lots of snacks. Stop at playgrounds. Um, and the main thing I would say is um, just leave bikes lying around. Like leave the kids' bike there. And if they want to pick it up, they'll pick it up. Don't kind of make a big deal of it. So that was Juliet. What did you think? I love her wild lifestyle and her openness of opinions. If you enjoyed this chat, check out our website, welovecycling.com, for more similar cycling content. And who would you like to see as a guest next time? Let us know on social media and we'll do our best to get them in. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. Bye.